So we're here with Ken from Badger Airbrushes Company. Hey. So anyway, so you were here this weekend for? Monster Palooza. And what's that about? Uh, it's a pretty awesome Hollywood special effects show. Mm -hmm. A lot of airbrush used in the industry of Hollywood and special effects and all the cool stuff that they do. And so uh, we come in town for that. We actually teach classes at that event. We classes Friday and Saturday. Oh, nice. And, uh, uh, the classes we do are actually on one-to-one -one scale figure um, bust that we do, but uh, it gets people oriented to airbrush who might not otherwise have that opportunity and lets them learn some things that uh, from pros that uh, you know are in the industry and well-recognized and have developed techniques that uh, make doing that type of stuff e easy and you know a little more efficient in what they do. So it's a cool event. They really pack them in. It's mm -hmm. over at the... Uh, uh, the Marriott and Burbank, and they, you know, they get some of the old time B movie stars and stuff like that out there yeah. to sign stuff. And people, you know, the kind of people that you look at, I know that person, I just don't know what I know him from <laughs> type actors and right. stuff. So, so it was cool. It's a good time. Cool, awesome. Now, for our hobby here, we do little figures and stuff like that. So, do you recommend doing like bigger stuff, like the one on one stuff, to really practice and hone in on your airbrush techniques? I think it really depends on what you're interested in. You know, it's. Uh, I think that's personal preference. I, I don't know that a lot of people who are in the horror and fantasy and figure kit genre, you know, are apt to jump in and start doing wargaming figures. Right. Um, you know, and at the same time, unless a wargamer has an interest in horror movies and monsters and stuff, they're probably not inclined to be interested in that. But, uh, um, you know... Anything you can do to enjoy whatever you're doing, and if airbrush is part of that, and you know improve your abilities with it and yeah. uh, increase your versatility at it, sure. I mean, uh, painting a one-to-one -one figure is going to be more similar to a vehicle that you guys might uh, use because right. it's a little bit larger piece. But even the figure kits and stuff, they come in smaller scales. We just happen to do one-to-one -one for the class because the company we par partner up with, Blackheart uh, Studios, they specialize in one-to-one. -one. Right. Uh, okay. monster figures so because of that partnership that's what we do that's what we use in the class okay so. great all right so uh one of the new products for badger is the minotaur uh airbrush paints line right minotaur 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 I'm not familiar you're not familiar with minotaur <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, Min minotaur is a new badger product and thanks to guys like yourself and mm -hmm. les and matthew fontaine who helped us uh, develop that product and uh, you know, make it something that was suitable to the audience for it. Um, it's been an enormous success, yeah. um, almost to the point where it's been too successful. So curse you, WG Consortium. <laughs> How can um, it be too successful? <laughs> well, you know, we're a small family-owned business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, the reception uh, of uh, the Minotaur product has been far beyond what we could have anticipated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, it, and so we're in a perpetual catch-up mode right now yeah. because it is still a new product. It's in its infancy, and people are still learning about it and, and seeing it for the first time. And right. when they see it and then all of a sudden they start looking around, they find other people who are, you know, uh, uh, fascinated and enjoying using the product. They want to try it. And, you know, and there's, there's a flip side of the learning curve where some of the things that uh, – um, you know, we've gone through with other paint products when we introduced it, Model Flex and Freak Flex and Nail Flare and Spectratex and things like that. You know, we've worked through all the things as people learn to use it, our idiosyncrasies of the product that right. even we need to figure out and become aware of so we can uh, uh, help people uh, more successfully and in enjoyably work with the product. We're going through that now with Minotaur where, mm -hmm. you know, the clear coats may not work the way that their model air clear coats work right. or uh, the metallics may lay on a little bit differently. And, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a learning curve on both sides, both from the user and from our side. Right. And uh, so those are some of the things we're finding out. We're fortunate to have a very good and capable chemist who, you know, a lot of times if we're aware of a concern or a problem, 
you know, something will go off in his head to say, okay, that's probably this. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's try and address it that way or tell the uh, end user, try this. So there is a learning curve, I think, with any new product. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, everyone's accustomed to what they've been doing, but when they see something new and possibly better and they want to try it and uh, they see the success others are having with it, they want to have that same right. success. Right. But sometimes you have to be taught, you know, uh, uh, kind of like working in an, uh, a new baseball mitt type right, thing, you know. Right. The old one worked great for you, but that new one, when you get it, you know, it's, uh, man, this is great, but you got to get comfortable with it right. first. You know, the ball will pop out a few times if the mitt's not worked in yet. Right, because so. I know that there is a lot of things that some people are running into, which I've never ran into, and I have no idea what they're talking about until, you know, I see it. It's, it's very hard because with so many people using it, everyone has their own, you know. Yeah. And, thing with it. and you know we've we've been getting little bits and pieces of that from people um haven't heard a lot of repetitive problems but everyone having their own little right. unique thing and you know that's uh, i think one of the things that badger's known for i hope we're known for is our our care for whoever's using our product so mm -hmm. you know if, as people have those concerns or situations or questions uh you know we hope they're not afraid to approach us and ask and know that we'll always do our best to uh, help them succeed with our product because we want them to enjoy using Badger stuff. Right. So, uh, you know, so if you got problems with Minotaur or concerns or questions, let us know. We'll do our best to make certain we make your usage of our product an enjoyable one. So. Yes, and we'll plug in all the information where you can get help down <laughs> at the bottom of the video below. <laughs> cool. Uh, one of the things I always, you know, advise people is like, they're always asking, well, I got the Patriot now. Should I go for the Sultar or should I go with the Chrome or whatever? I always tell them, okay, well, go start with the Patriot, go Chrome, and then Sultar. And then there's all these other utility brushes around, like the 360 and the Anthem, and depending on what you want to do and stuff. What, what would be your advice? I mean, what would be the actual logical choice of... Well, you from? actually, in asking your question, answered your question because you said depending on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's how you choose an airbrush. Right. Depending on what you want to do, an airbrush is made to that application or yeah. likely to be made to that application. There's really not a graduated process. You don't start with this one right. and then this one and then this one. You have your airbrush that's best for base coating. If your budget allows you to have an airbrush that's good for base coating and an airbrush that's good for other things, mm -hmm. you get both airbrushes. Right. Um, you know, for instance, in, in your applications, I would tell people the Patriot is a base coat general detail airbrush. Mm -hmm. Now, in larger scales, I might not say that because in larger scales, the Patriot, you know, has a downside in that the couple only holds so much material. For instance, right. the one to one figures we were working with at Monster Palooza. If we had the ability in a classroom environment to use all the most efficient tools, we would add bottom feed airbrushes in there right. to do all the base coats on these things because they're larger pieces. And, you know, we had to fill the cup numerous times in order to get it done. Now, on your scale, um, you know, a color cup on top of a Patriot's going to hold more than enough color to right. base coat a piece. So, so it's a little bit different in that the applications that you have in your specific usage of the airbrush um, aren't as aren't as vast. You've got mm -hmm. your uh, my recommendation generally when we get contacted by a war gamer is your Patriot is your general detail base coat gun, and then your Chrome or Sotar are your finite detail airbrushes. And the difference in those two things and how you would choose it is your feel, your feel. Uh, of the airbrush because the spray pattern potential of the Chrome and the Sotar are identical. Oh, the, so they are identical. They're, they are identical. The, they, of the needle has or... the same linear airflow angle okay. in both of them, and the tips have the same aperture in okay. both of them. So they're going to produce the same atomization. The Sotar is a little bit more technical pencil feeling, yeah. whereas the Chrome's a little more Mont Blanc pen type feel to it. So, and that's probably why I always switch to the Sotar when I get really close with stuff, because it has that yeah. feel of getting really close to the, absolutely. Absolutely. the model versus the Chrome where it has a longer front yeah. end. It's just a little... Yeah. too far for me and you know I, I think part of that is because the sotar was developed by illustrators mm -hmm. guys who sit down at a drawing table and do their okay. illustrations and they're right over top of them and it's a lot of in tight nook and cranny painting whereas the chrome which came out of the velocity from the renegade the original renegade series was developed by a fine scale military modeler right um so he's working in a little he's working more of a workbench type 
environment as a, opposed to a drawing table right. environment. So, so that's kind of the difference there. You know, you guys, you guys probably work more like illustrators, I would say, simply because of the size of your piece right. um, that you're working on. You have to get in tighter on it to do what you want to do because your whole world is smaller. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, so if the needle size is the same, what about the trigger? I noticed that the trigger on the soft eyes is a little more sensitive. Or maybe that's just my imagination. That's your imagination. Is it Charlie? really? You have a very active imagination. Yes, you want that trigger to feel different, <laughs> so it feels different. Same, same, tr same, same trigger, trigger linkage okay. and everything in the sotar. And maybe the I chrome, just keep so. my sotar cleaner than my chrome. That very well may be. Shame <laughs> on you. Y your chrome will hold it against you. Yes, it will. So okay, so we know that there's okay. Then no actual difference between the sotar and the chrome, other than the feel of it. The feel is the okay. biggest difference, and the size of the color cup, which well, again obviously. goes to the feel. Um, and the trigger's a little bit closer to the color cup on the sotar. Okay. So okay, so that was one of the questions our user uh, submitted in. Now, thank you for the excellent <laughs> question, user. Excellent question. Okay, uh, what's the difference between the Renegade Velocity and the Chrome? The difference between the Renegade Velocity and the Chrome is that the Renegade series, when it was first developed, it was developed for custom auto painters, guys mm -hmm. who do graphics on cars. Okay. And they tend to be very heavy-handed airbrush users. Um, they're guys who shoot spray guns all the time, um, work in an environment where... You know, everything's, you know, arr, you know, the old Tim Allen uh, right. uh, character from uh, the whatever. Home Improvement. Home Improvement, yeah. yeah you know, arr, arr, arr. Right. you know they're, they're those type of guys. Um, so the trigger mechanism on it is was more suited to what they did. The guys who worked on that airbrush were more in that field. Mm -hmm. Well, when we came out with that airbrush and people started to use it and talk about it, um, it came into the fine scale modeling market. Right. And one of the things that we started to hear from the fine scale modeling market is we absolutely love the performance of the airbrush. But man, that trigger is like cumbersome yeah. to us because those guys work more like illustrators. Right. Um, you know, who want, they want to control their trigger more than their trigger controls them. Yeah. You know, the automotive painting guy, they want to control their trigger, but they want their trigger to be you know, giving them a little bit of a challenge right. um, while they're doing it. Um, so what we did was we we worked with a, a, a fine-scale military modeler, a gentleman by the name of Cyrus Tan, Cy, yeah. very, very talented uh, guy, uh, you know, world-renowned. He actually won the first Tamiya right. model contest where Tamiya flies you over to Japan and stuff. And, and he checked out the velocity at an international uh, uh, plastic modeler society convention and he took the time to tell me, you know, this is really nice. I really like the performance on it, but, man, I sure wish that trigger was softer. And I asked Sai if he'd be interested in helping us design something that he thought would be more suitable to fine scale modelers and how they use airbrushes in the field they'd like to have for it. And uh, he graciously agreed to help us out with that. And that's where the chrome came into being. And some of the things that he felt were important were softer trigger. Mm -hmm. So we put the badger trinker. Uh, trigger linkage into the chrome which the the renegades originally had a theron chandler trigger linkage okay. which is a tensor uh, spring inside of the uh, the tube shank the needle right. tube mechanism that's there so that addressed that to soften it up and at that same time we had also started to develop with uh, one of our uh, materials finishing companies a material that was designed to take non-mating parts that rub against each other and smooth out and mm -hmm. reduce the friction for them. Right. So we actually introduced that on the uh, the original Renegade series, and so it was instantaneously available on the Chrome, so that gotcha. helped as well right. uh, with it. So we had a softer trigger mechanism, and we had the, uh, the new finish that we put on the trigger and the rocker lever where they rub against each other right. to eliminate that any friction that's there. And then we took uh, some of the things from the Sotar that uh, Cyrus liked, and incorporated that into the chrome. So it's got that micrometer needle setting on the back where on the Renegade it just has a needle setting. It doesn't right. have something that you can hone in on a very precise reference uh, to come back to later. And then we put the finger thumb rest uh, uh, from the Sotar okay. on the gun. And, uh, um, you know, those were the those were the big things. Uh, every, everything else was... Uh, Pretty minor. Uh, it was it was more to distinguish the chrome from the balance of the Renegade series. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously it's chrome plated. 
um, as opposed to the uh, the more platinum looking uh, um, Renegade series. So the things that are most notable to a user is it's got a softer trigger tension, it's got that finger thumb rest, and the micrometer setting are the are the three things that are the biggest, biggest differences yeah. in uh, in the Velocity Renegade series versus the Chrome. Uh, another question that does come up a lot um, when I'm feeling questions is about the price of the Soltar. Why is it cheaper than the actual Chrome if they're the same airbrush? Well, we'll give some insider trading information okay. to answer that. Seeing we're a privately held company, it's not really insider no. trader information. So I don't think we can get busted for this. Um, Sotar is unique in its pricing because generally at Badger, our process is what does it cost to make something and um, what, is, what does it need to be priced at retail-wise to fit into the distribution network properly. Mm -hmm. And Sotar is one of the few products that doesn't fall under that because at the time we developed the Sotar, and this goes back about 15 years, the artists that we worked with in developing that product one of the things they really felt was important was to price that product uh, retail-wise, retail price-wise, equivalent to what they felt it was comparable to. Mm, okay. So at that time, uh, the product from another brand that you know the Sotar was the target for, um, that these guys were all users of, that product was priced at about 450 to 500 dollars. Mm. So they felt it would be very difficult to have a product priced at you know 200 dollars and try to convince people it's the same in its performance capabilities as an airbrush that costs 450 to 500 dollars. So we we bumped it up more to the the 400 dollar price range. Now what we did do since day one with that is our pricing to the distribution network was not done under a discount structure because mm -hmm. generally the way Badger works, you know, we sell the hobby distributors and dealers and stuff like that, and we have a discount structure. So there's a distributor discount and a dealer discount. Um, so obviously they're buying at a discount, and obviously when it gets to the end user, they've added everything back in that puts it closer to the manufacturer's suggested retail price. So everyone gets their little piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. In the case of the SOTAR, we net priced it from the get-go, saying that, you know, we don't need to make more on this product. We're cool selling the airbrushes the way we've always sold them. So we'll let the dealer, you know, do their yeah. pricing levels that they want. And some people don't want to give up that perceived value, and they put it out there at that price. And others like to go the route of uh, MSRP $400, our price $125 or, yeah. or, or something like that because they're looking uh, more for the consumer who's going to, pay higher attention to price than anything else. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, that's the difference between the guy who might shop at the local Walmart or the guy who, you know, might go to the higher-end uh, store. So, okay. But uh, there's a place for both of them, and uh, some dealers sell them at 400 bucks. They don't sell as many, but they make more money when they sell one. Yeah. So Okay, I guess that works too. <laughs> yeah. All right, the next thing I, I want to ask, because this is a real, I mean, people get confused about that. They think the smaller the needle size, the more finer line you get. Is that right? It's right, but that's only part of the equation, mm -hmm. okay, because the other thing that comes into play is the media that the you media spray that with it. Okay. Um, I mean, ultimately, with a, uh, an ultra-fine, good example, using the chrome and uh, in the, uh, the SOTARs, which... Well, let's just go with the chrome because it's ultra fine and fine. Okay. Okay. I can get a finer line with the ultra fine. I can get a finer dot pattern with the ultra fine. But because the aperture is smaller than the fine, it's going to be more sensitive to pop, proper paint preparation and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Ultimately, the finest line I can produce is using a medium like an ink or a watercolor or a dye mm -hmm. through an ultra fine airbrush. It's probably going to go pretty problem free because you don't have pigmentation to deal with and mess right. around with uh, in it. Um, and it's going to produce a nice fine line. I can also do that with the acrylics, but because you're talking about pigments, um, you're talking about a greater potential for clogging. And I think probably most people who are watching this have painted with an airbrush and they realize when they're using an acrylic, there's a tendency for it to clog. Whether they're using an Iwata airbrush, a Badger airbrush, a Badger airbrush, you know, your medium's going to dictate, you know, what's going to happen at the airbrush. I kind of I use this analogy when I try to describe this. Um, if you can envision a room of people in a single door to get in and out of that room and someone yells fire. Mm 
Yeah. Okay. Well, someone else fire, everyone goes to the door. If it's a single door, a couple people are probably going to get tied up at that doorway. Um, if you have a double door room, people are going to get out a little more fluently. Right. So, and, you know, and there's other things. I mean, you can look at uh, uh, pigment sizes as fat people and skinny people. Mm. Okay. I'm a big pigment. You know, other people are smaller pigments right. um, than me. So if I'm in that room yelling fire, you know, the smaller pigments better hope they get to the door before I do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 but the difference there is the difference in a fine art acrylic, mm -hmm. um, you know, something like a Liquitex or a Golden, uh, where it's a finely ground pigment. And, uh, you know, a brand that's popular in the game, game uh, wargaming industry that I just won't use the name of, but it's in every gamer's workshop store. Right. Um, that pigment isn't ground as finely. It's more for brush painting. Right. Now, people do reduce it and try to spray it, but when you reduce it, you're not shrinking the size of the pigment. So it's still fat guys right. going out of the airbrush. I see. Um, you know, so, you know, things like Minotaur and Model Air and, and, and Liquitex and Golden, things that those are brands that you do need to thin down in order to spray them, um, you know, are, are the skinny guys. Um, that are more suited to being used in an airbrush. Now, is there a medium or thinner that actually does size down the pigment? No, because no. the, the pigment size is established by how it's ground, ground it. into okay. pigment. So, right. And I couldn't tell you, um, you know, all the different types of grinding. There's three different types of grinding that can be done. The finest is uh, ball grinding, which is what is done with things like Liquitex and okay. Golden Acrylics and Minotaurs and Model Air and stuff like that. I guess another way to look at that, though, is... You can make the room bigger, going back to the analogy of the right. double door, single door, and fat people and skinny people. Uh -huh. um, I imagine if you reduce something enough, you can make that bigger pigment so it'll get to the door in an even stream. Um, but at the same time, you're probably going to lose some surface tension right. if you go that far with it an adhesion characteristic uh, okay. that you want to have. So you can't reduce the size of the pigment, but you could probably dilute it further. I think at some point, though, you'd have a problem with how the finish lays onto the model. So then, uh, okay, the needle size is just half of the battle. The other thing is what you're using. What you're using in the airbrush and, and pressures and stuff Pressure like PSI's. that as well. I mean, one of the other things that I always make a point of mentioning is that, you know, when you're using an airbrush, you're drying the paint while you're applying the paint. So, mm. you know, if your pressure isn't right, if it's too high or higher than it needs to be, you're going to dry it faster and you're going to clog mm. a little bit more. We'll go on to some of the questions that uh, some users submitted. Cool. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, why does the Chrome come with an adapter for other airbrush hoses but not the Patriot 105? Well, if we put the uh, adapter in with the Patriot 105, there'd be another group of people that doesn't have to buy it. <laughs> uh, you know, the primary reason for that, in all honesty, is when the Chrome came into being, um, we found a, an audience with users of a competitive product. Okay. And the one thing that several people had expressed to us was, I've heard great things about the Chrome. I'm using brand I airbrush, and uh, I'd really like to try it, but I got all brand I hoses and mm -hmm. stuff like that, and I don't have to buy all that stuff. So once we heard that for about the thousandth time, we said, you know, we should just put the adapter for brand I in with the Chrome yeah. uh, airbrush. Now, there's obviously people that are using the other brand in a, in some of their lower, um, uh, not lower quality, but their, their lesser precise application airbrushes that are now coming over to Patriots yeah. um, as well. You know, it's one of those things, so it hasn't been as prominently requested of us that you know, would justify us putting that adapter uh, in with the uh, in with the Patriot. But the Chrome, we're still getting a lot of converts coming over, and gotcha. they, they really appreciate having that uh, that adapter. It's one less okay. thing they need so to buy. So basically it's a marketing decision on that airbrush. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, originally, if people have the original Chromes, they didn't come with the adapters. That oh, was right. something that happened okay. after the product was launched. And, you know, a lot of uh, um, people who are, we call them converts now, um, were that was the reason they were giving that they haven't gone out and got one and tried it, right? <laughs> despite what they were hearing. So, okay. you know, and that's the type of thing that I, I, I hope we're a company that people know we care about what they tell right. us. And when we heard that enough times, we said, okay, we need to address this uh, for people. Okay. So if you have an original Chrome without an adapter, we'll send you one. <laughs> so. There you go. Um, okay, second question. Uh, what do you think about the ball-jointed trigger mechanism used by companies like H&S and 
Uh, will we see something similar in the Badger products in the future? We've taken a look at what uh, H&S have. They, they make an excellent product. I mean, that's that's one of the other things for us is we do a lot of research of what our competitors are doing. Mm-hmm. So we're aware of it if they have design ideas that, uh, you know, might be beneficial for us to look at and incorporate, see if we can improve uh, to, to be even better. We don't, we don't copy anybody, but if they have an idea that we can improve on and uh, – uh, and get into our product, we certainly uh, want to do that because okay. I think that makes us more attractive to, uh, to you know, potential users of our product. Right now, there's no plans to do that the trigger mechanism. You know, we've talked to a lot of people about it, and it's kind of a you love it or hate it thing. Yeah. I think anyone who's been using an airbrush for any great length of time, they want to push down right. that, that trigger, and when it doesn't really go down... It feels foreign to them. Um, I I think part of that, though, is they have that pointed trigger. Right. And when you push down on that thing, you can figure you can get pretty sore, you know, (laughs) when that trigger's not going down when you're pushing down on it, but you still (laughs) want to push down on it. But uh, um, Hotter and Steenbeck has a lot of cool things in their design. I mean, they're a German company, and uh, German engineering and German design is always top-notch. Yeah. I mean, my last name is Schlottfeld. Uh, I'm German. Uh, But... uh, um, you know, so yeah, they are one of the companies that we watch and see what they they do and what they got going on, and uh, nothing that we've uh, uh, planned to incorporate into our designs right now. But it doesn't mean later on uh, we might not give it consideration. You know, we're perpetually trying to do new stuff and right. look at new designs and ideas and stuff like that. So, and I think that's evident in the fact that in the last five years through a recession, we've come out with five new airbrushes and uh, two new lines of paint. So yeah. that's a perpetual thing that's never going to change. And you know, some of doing that right is to take a look at what design ideas are out there, whether they're coming from end users or if they're, you know, out there from our competitors. Okay, so, so um, for people that don't know, what exactly is this uh, ball joint mechanism? Well, it, it's a mechanism, and most uh, airbrushes are set up so that you push down to actuate your airflow right. um, in the airbrush, and you pull the trigger back to make it move. On the Hotter and Steenbeck, it's one motion. It's just uh, you you push down. You you don't really push down. You more pull back, and as you pull back, that uh, the way that bottom is designed, it pushes down the ball for you uh, as you pull the trigger back. It's kind of hard to explain. So uh, it's like playing asteroids instead of Pac-Man, in a way. I, I couldn't answer that for you. It's been so long <laughs> so since long. I played asteroids or Pac-Man that that I don't remember. Um, yeah. You know, I'm trying to think what might be another. Ana- you know, it's kind of uh, a good analogy is anyone who's using a pistol grip airbrush. Okay. Um, uh, the, the Grex or the Iwata uh, pistol grip guns. When you pull that trigger back, it you, there's no pushing down motion like you have on a, on a top trigger airbrush. When you pull that trigger back, you actuate both your airflow and your color flow. Color flow yeah. um, at first, it cu- as it comes back, it actuates the airflow, and then it hits the angle, yeah. and then it starts to open the needle so that the paint comes out. Um, Hot Iron Steenbeck's design does that same thing in a in a top uh, top feed airbrush. Now, the interesting thing about that is um, we actually have a similar um, design in that the airbrushes that we make for beauty and bakery applications. Mm-hmm. We actually call them reverse single action because usually in a single action airbrush, by definition, as most hobbyists know it, that's where you set your spray pattern first and then you just press your trigger and the preset amount of color comes out. In the bakery and beauty industry, it's the opposite. We remove the valve spring from the airbrush so the air is constantly flowing through it. Mm -hmm. So all the operator does is pulls the trigger back and gets color whenever they pull back on the trigger. They never have to push down. Oh. And... To someone who, someone who's using a hot iron Steenbeck airbrush, the reverse single action feels very much the same because when you try to push down, it doesn't go down right. because it's already in the down position because the spring's been removed from the airbrush. So all you do is pull back. So I, I guess inadvertently we do have a similar um, design that was never really the intention. And it, uh, the fact of the matter is in bakery and beauty, uh, the airflow needs to be continuous to keep the material wet. Gotcha. Uh, when they're using it, kind of like a pond, you know, where air keeps that pond there yeah. by keeping the uh, the air flowing across it. Okay. Hey, um, I would like to know if there's a smaller um, tip and needle conversion available for the Patriot 105. 
I actually wrote a blog entry on that, and it has, what, three, I think, three kits? There are four? three needles and nozzles that three can needles, be yeah. uh, used on the, on the Patriot airbrush. The standard uh, needle nozzle on the uh, Patriot is the, what we call the detail nozzle. Mm -hmm. um, it's a .5 setup. The, uh, the three different nozzles, you have super detail, detail, and general purpose. Okay. Now, a lot of people know them as fine, medium, and large. Um, how that happened, I don't know, but uh, um, I've always titled them Super Detail, Detail, and General Purpose. Initially, when the Pro Production Series was introduced, which the Patriot is part of, there was only Detail and General Purpose. Oh, okay. um, as a lot of people came to us and said, uh, you know, the, the competitive product in another brand has a smaller nozzle. Are you guys planning to do that? We heard it enough times again that we said, yeah, okay, we should we should do this. We should come out with the 0.3 right. nozzle, and that became the super detail. Now, that's nozzle. the same conversion kit that you used for the Anthem 155. The yes, absolutely. The, the Pro Production Series consists of the Patriot 105, the Anthem 155, the Universal 360, and the 200NH. Okay. So any of those, um, you can put the super detail, the detail, or the general purpose purpose nozzle on the 0 0.3, 0 0.5, or 0 0.7. The thing that's important is to know that you need to change the tip, the needle, and, and the, the spray, spray regulator. Yeah. A lot of people just change the tip and the needle, and then they put the spray regulator on, and yeah. it doesn't, uh, doesn't work. work properly. And uh, they write us an email how they got a bad... Uh, um, you know, tip and needle or right. whatever, and uh, but uh, but that's something that's usually figured out quite easily and corrected quite quickly. Okay, and for more information about those conversion kits, I actually have a, a blog entry on that, so just check out the WGC blog uh, to get more information on that. All right, uh, the next question: How would one acquire potential sponsorship from Badger? <laughs> sponsorship? What's a sponsorship? Uh, <laughs> You know, that's the type of thing that we always in welcome inquiries from people um, about that. It, that's a budget thing more so than anything else. Badger, like any other company, has budgets that yeah. it uses. And, you know, part of that budget is a marketing budget, and part of that marketing budget is a sponsorship budget. And, uh, you know, if if there's funds available to do it and we can see a return on the investment of it, allocating that part of the budget to that sponsorship... We're always open to that. I mean, we're, we're, we're business with it. We hate to say no, but at the same time, you know, we have to make certain that where we are saying yes, that, uh, um, you know, it's uh, it's going to benefit us as well right. as the person that we're, uh, that we're sponsoring. And, of course, for us, we, we do do – I mean, you know we do sponsorships because you're one of the people we sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Les is another person that we sponsor. We sponsor people in the bakery industry, in the taxidermy industry. Um you know, so we are open to that. At the same time, you can't say yes to everybody because right. I can tell you that we get at least a dozen sponsorship requests every week. And, you know, basically what we do, I mean, right now those budgets are pretty tapped for yeah. us. And that's primarily because we have a very solid sponsorship relationship in all the categories we want to have that. Mm -hmm. Um you know, but that doesn't mean at some point that the the person that we're working with and have a relationship in I don't know, goalie mask painting isn't going to stop painting goalie mask at some point. <laughs> you know, and that, and that opens an opportunity for a new relationship right. with somebody. Hey, you, you laugh, but we have a relationship with probably the, one of the most known NHL goalie mask painters. Really? Uh, Jason Livery from Headstrong Graphics. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, you know, we're privileged that Jason uses our product. He's used it for 20 years. I've known him since he was a 16-year-old uh, uh, kid, and I was much younger myself. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he, you know, see Jason's stuff, go look at Bill Elliott from the St. Louis Blues goalie mask. <laughs> that's what he paints. But we're proud to have, you know, the privilege that he chose our product to use. And so when he needs something, we throw something his way because there's a mutual benefit in that for us because we can say, look what our stuff does. It does some pretty incredible artwork. He, he was actually chosen, uh, I used Bill Elliott's uh, mask as a reference because that was the goalie mask of the year last year in oh, the NHL, nice. and Jay painted it. So I can honestly say that a Badger Airbrush contributed to you know, the goalie mask of the year last year. Uh, in the NHL, you know, because one of the things that Badger contends with is that there's this perception we're a hobby airbrush, uh, and that's not the case. I mean, there's l there's little, if anything, you can't do with a Badger that you can't do with other airbrushes that people automatically recognize mm -hmm. as, uh, 
as high-end airbrushes and you know that's that's part of what the the chrome and and the velocity and stuff like that is a, is about to uh show people that you know we can make point twenty one airbrushes that'll do hairlines and do you know pimples on a gnat's ass or whatever you right. want to uh, say about it but uh you know, it's uh, you know, people need to open their mind to that possibility, and people like Jason and uh, and and I mean, look what Les does with this stuff. Look what you do with this stuff. I mean, uh, it's incredibly finite detail work. I mean, uh, um, so uh, you know, that's that's part of the benefit of a sponsorship for us is you know people can see what uh, what happens with our product, uh, um, you know, what the capability of the product is through the the artists that put it to such excellent right. use. So. Showing it, off, showing off the product, basically. Yep. So you can always ask the, you know, the worst we're going to do is say mm-hmm. no, not at this time. But, you know, uh, we're not, we're not going to say no, get lost. Right. We're going to say no. We appreciate your interest, uh, but right now we can't do something. But, uh, you know, in the future, if there's that opportunity, we'll keep your information on file. And in the meantime, if there's a way we can help you out, we'll try to do that. So. Yeah. The only time Ken says get lost is when you ask him for a thousand chrome needles. <laughs> yeah. Didn't work. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. I got my airbrush uh, a few days ago and I tried it fully out yesterday, but during the painting session, I discovered the needle won't go all the way to the back. There seemed to be an object inside the nozzle that was stopping it. I cleaned the airbrush, something something that seemed to fix the problem, but it happened again three times after that. Now, that's a common question. That's why I put it in here um, because there's actually a way to fix it. I believe that's the, uh, oh, well, this, the Teflon seal that's causing that maybe. Well, yeah, and and what that is, what that possibly is, is there's a Teflon seal inside that airbrush that's adjustable, mm-hmm. okay? And it is set at the factory because the airbrushes are tested before they leave the building. And, uh, you know, it's I don't know if it's something related to transit or whatever, you know, because in, in transit a lot of people don't realize you're talking about brass parts. Brass is a soft material. You have a, a threaded piece that holds that seal that's screwed into the inside body of the airbrush Mm -hmm. and uh, you know it is possible that in transit depending on where it's going you know the longer the trip the more likely there is to be a change if we don't if someone in the testing room is remiss in retracting the needle a little bit before it goes out the door after they've tested it and that needle and tip are resting against each other it's not unlikely that either that tip and needle are going to be embedded against each other or that tip might be split. So we have to Ooh. make certain that we do that. Yeah. Uh, when it happens, we, we almost always know what's happened, what the cause of it is. And I think the same happens a little bit with that screw because it's a very fine screw. It's a, You actually need an eyeglass screwdriver to get at it and do it. Yeah. And generally, I have sent out quite a few emails lately to people who have indicated my needle gets hung up with it. And... Uh, uh, we're probably at some point we just need to do a quick YouTube video on how to adjust that uh, that yeah. that seal inside because generally when you explain to someone how to do it and they do it and they'll email you back that fixed it thanks very much right. cool. type I thing. know Mario had that problem and Fear yeah. GFX had that problem and, and that's that's the inner seal on the inside and really what you need to do you need to take the guts out of the gun um, mm-hmm. in order to access that inner seal inside take a small eyeglass screwdriver get it in the back side and uh, the adjustment is very slight, maybe a sixteenth to an eighth turn um, very, very, uh, of very it. Slight. And you know, once you've done that, take the needle, just the needle, rather than putting it all back together. Take the needle and put it through. You should feel where you're passing through the seal, right? But it shouldn't be hanging up. up you should yeah. feel it, but it's stu- but it's still smooth movement. And if it's if it feels too loose, you probably need to turn it back the other okay. way a little bit. If it's not loose enough yet, give it another sixteenth to eighteenth turn. Okay, so. I'll do a video on that later then. So, pretty easy. Okay, um, next question. What would be a good reducer to use with Badger Minotaur paints, and how much would you use uh, a one-to-one uh, thinning ratio on? Is Liquidex air thinner reducer a better product to use instead of alcohol, Windex, and it's really for airbrushing? I, I don't know why you would thin Minotaur. <laughs> it's hard to think Well, yeah, I, I mean, well, you might thin it for different effects and stuff. Okay. I mean, uh, um, you know, that's, who knows, that's probably somewhere in some less bursley video somewhere where you thin something probably. to do a wash effect or something like that. And there is a reason to do that uh, uh, every once in a while, depending on what the artist wants to accomplish with it. But uh, but if you do want to thin Minotaur, water's sufficient water. to do it. And what I tell people is if you're going to use all that paint at once, use tap water. 
If you're going to store that paint after you thin it a little bit, you're only going to use a portion of the paint. Use some distilled water, distilled water okay. for it. So um, now the other part of that question that that always troubles me is, first of all, alcohol is not a thinning agent for water-based paint. I know a lot of people do it. There's a lot of information about it, but water-based acrylics, the biggest frustration most people have with them, and, and I guess advice like this is directed more at the newbie than the aspiring artist. The experienced guy has gone through what he needs to figure out right. what works for him and what doesn't. But I can never make the recommendation to a newbie or an aspiring artist to thin with alcohol. The reason for that is I know one of the biggest concerns with acrylic paints is how quickly they dry yeah. and the clogging that that causes. You introduce alcohol into it, which dries faster than water, and you've now accelerated that dry time and increased the probability that you're going to clog. So stay away from alcohol. There may come a day in time when you're more experienced and, you know, for whatever reason you want to do introduce alcohol because someone told you you should and now's the time to try it. I, I don't think it's ever necessary, but if it works for other people, by all means, you know, have at it. Um, and the other thing is that uh, an ammonia-based cleaner like a Windex is not a thinning agent. Right. It's a cleaning mm -hmm. agent. Um, so, you know, we formulated the paint with the ingredients that we think are necessary to make it the paint it's supposed to be for the application. To introduce um, new ingredients into that formula, you know, I'd, I'd never recommend that. Now, yeah. water's in the formula. Um, you know, the other thing is extender um, mm -hmm. that we have, which is there's also some of that in the formulation of the paint. So um, theoretically, extender could be considered a thinning agent because there's no pigment in it. Right. Um, so you're actually, when you add extender, you can, you're can you thinning the paint a little bit because you don't have the pigment base ratio. Right. You just have the thinning agent. But at the same time, you can't really you overuse it as a thinner because then your paint's never going to dry. Okay, so I know alcohol sometimes has some weird effects on acrylic paint, like gunking it. Making yeah, it that that is a big problem. Uh, you know, we get a lot of people that uh, clean their airbrush with alcohol. Yeah, and why they do that, I I don't know. But the problem is, if you don't get everything out, alcohol and water based paints tend to get pretty gunky. Yeah. A lot of times, we'll get airbrushes back at the factory, and you know, once we're able to get the needle out, you can see all this gunk buildup that's on there, and you right away you pretty sure what it is yeah. um, and it's usually some form of alcohol water-based paint mix that's just gunked onto the onto the needle so you know alcohol and water-based paints are not compatible right so uh, the next question is I have a renegade velocity and I love it and if I choose to add to my collection which additionally includes in a very old Pache early 90s bottom feed what would you suggest I would assume that it would be good to get an updated bottom feed airbrush so would the Rage be best, or is there something more versatile that you suggest in your line? Well, if if there's any Badger airbrush you don't have, you should have it to have a full collection. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I agree. So, <laughs> so start there, and, you know, basically uh, it, it, we're going to start putting them in Happy Meals, so you can collect them that way too. So there you but, go. Uh, but, no, it really depends on what you – what the airbrushes you have already aren't doing for you. Right. Okay. You know, sometimes I understand people buy airbrushes just to buy airbrushes. And God bless you for doing that. But I'm also the type of person that, you know, I do believe you can have airbrushes you don't need. Right. I know that probably sounds absurd. Here's the president of Badger Airbrush Company say, there, I can have airbrushes I don't need. <laughs> but uh, But the reality of it is, if the airbrushes you have aren't doing something that you want to do, there's probably an airbrush that will do it. That's the that's the airbrush to get. Yeah, if yeah. if you want to, you know, complete the range of what airbrushes can do for you. If the airbrushes you have are doing everything you need, then you know, buy more paint or buy more models. You know, use your money in a manner that's going to be more enjoyable for you, rather than buying an airbrush that you're not likely to put to a lot of use right. because it didn't really add anything to. Um, you know, to what you needed. Um, you know, the gentleman says he's got an old, uh, old Pache bottom feed, so it's probably a VL, uh, which is an excellent gun for doing a lot of base coating and, uh, and larger stuff like that. He's got a Renegade Velocity, which is a good detail gun, uh, a good finite detail gun. You know, if there's something in there that's not being accomplished, I, I would say that taking into account those ends of the spectrum that he has, the old Pache and the, uh, uh, the Renegade Velocity, 
There's probably in the middle there a gravity feed general detail airbrush that would be useful to him, um, especially if he's working on uh, on minis. Mm -hmm. um, simply because of the fact that although the Pache is an excellent base coating airbrush, a bottom feed airbrush for miniatures is uh, that's a lot of airbrush. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, and you and you have to spray that bottom feed airbrush at 20, 25 psi. So just to get the mini in a stationary yeah. position while you're painting it is a little bit of a uh, of a difficulty. So my recommendation is uh, possibly look at a Patriot or uh, the Eclipse gravity feed gun or something like that. Look harder at the Patriot than the Eclipse uh, gravity feed gun. But even the Talon is another airbrush. That would be the only thing I would see in there that possibly he could improve. Um, you know what the airbrush is able to do for him. Uh, next question: Could I bring a Badger airbrush to the Badger facility for factory labor repairs? Yes, absolutely. People do that all the time. Okay, great. That was easy. Now, one of the things is... No, uh, don't come to our building. <laughs> you psycho. We won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't come in. All right, one of the things um, is distribution. I mean, people are still, like, trying to get the militaries, especially <laughs> in internationally, right? So they're asking, like, I, I don't know. I don't want to read this whole thing off because... Uh, let's read it off. You want to read it off? All right. Are you guys... Ran this is Chung's script. This, this is not a script. script. This is the question they sent in. Okay. <laughs> this is your script. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Your script. Are you guys ramping up production of the paint range to handle demand? When will distribution of the set for the entire range be allowed to stores like Amazon? Um, yes, we are ramping up production of the paint range as best we can. Um in all honesty, we are beyond capacity right now, but we're trying to increase capacity. We're waiting for some filling equipment to arrive that will hey, help you guys even facilitate that. Open so, extra rooms in the factory. Yeah, here, we've, we've the actually condo. added three people in our paint room, um, but until the new equipment uh, gets in, yeah. there's not much we can do that. We're not the only one with long lead times. The paint filling people have long equipment. People have long lead times <laughs> as well. Um, but uh, we actually have made several shipments to Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of how quick they're getting out once they have it. Um, Amazon is sending us orders weekly because people continue to order okay. weekly. So, you know, it, it, it's a perpetual situation. We're making some progress on it, not the amount of progress we'd like to. Um, you know, because, you know, a lot of people say it's a good problem to, you know, have yeah, orders. Right. And there's no such thing as a good problem. Right. Um, but uh, but we're making some progress in it. And, uh and, you know, we're, we're hopeful in the relatively near future we can keep up with the demand for the product in a little bit better fashion than we've been able to so far. But, again, uh, we started out this interview, and I mentioned that uh, the Minotaire demand far exceeded what we would have yeah. anticipated. And, you know, that's probably the fault of guys like you and Les and uh, and Hugo and uh, and all those uh, good yeah, people out there who have, you know, uh, you know done the 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 favorite for us of reviewing the product and talking about it and uh, you know and uh, so where is the scapegoat so it's all Every, anything it's that all happens, your fault it's yeah, all our ab fault absolutely yeah. he blames absolutely. me he calls me up and shouts well, at me and, and of course you guys are coming in for adepticon next week yeah. and we do expect you to this spend week. a couple days uh, at the factory filling yeah. paint oh yeah, yeah um, that's right you're there you made the problem you can participate in solving the problem uh, <laughs> yeah that's why that's why uh and, I didn't and we'll, get, Hugo, we'll get that on youtube <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> so, hours of us just filling paint by the way they are in amazon and amazon have been shipping them out on the back orders i've been getting reports in from uh the, uh, the community yeah. about that. And Amazon wants us to be caught up too, and we want yeah. to be caught up. We're not intentionally withholding product. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and we'll do our best. Uh, stick with us. You'll get your paint. You'll be glad. I, I have yet to have someone tell me it wasn't worth the wait. No. So. Okay. Uh, I can, I was wondering if you have any shops in e EU Norway that sells your paints and or airbrushes. Um. Norway specifically off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what shops have it because we sell to a distributor. The mm -hmm. distributor there is Tiller. Tiller. Um, in Norway? In Norway. Okay. Yeah, we ship to them. They then distribute to hobby shops. Um, so we don't know the hobby shops. Right. We know the distributor. The best resource for Badger product in Europe, um, you know, we always encourage people to stay within their own country right because that helps us in the relationships we have with those distributors but 
um, uh, www.intl-trade.eu is one company that we can confidently send people to. They carry everything that we have. Oh, okay. As soon as we introduce something, they place an order for it. We know they have Minotaur. We know they have Chromes. Um, you know, it's uh, th that's our most reliable distributor. We have other good distributors in the in in various countries, but the consumers don't necessarily have access to them. They right. can't order through the distributor, but they can contact the distributor, find out what dealers might have something that someone's looking for. If you go to our website, I think there's some information on it. Uh, probably not overly up to date because we're working on a new website right now and haven't done much to update the old one. But um, but internationaltrade.eu is, okay. a, is a good resource. If you're in the U.K., Barwell Body Works, uh, uh, .co UK also uh, does a pretty good job with a lot of the specialty products and stuff that people are looking for. Okay. Uh, next question. What I'd like to know is if there is an ETA on the mid tear paints that will be available in Europe. We already asked that, right? Tried yes. a few months ago, but the only place they sell are U.S. and the new USPS prices are too expensive. Yeah, I mean, depending on what country that person is from, uh, again, I, I would tell you Europe in general, www.internationaltrade.eu, international abbreviated INTL. Okay. And uh, if you're in the UK, Barwell Body Works is the best place uh, for Minotaur right now. Okay. So. Um, the next one is finding parts. The same thing, except uh, he's trying to find parts and uh, for his airbrush, and he's in Canada. So... He says that Michael is a little too expensive, and then ordering one part from Win Win is a little expensive. What is there any other place yeah, to get parts? It, you know, hey there, um, yeah, hoser. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's one of those situations that there's not much we can do with that. You mm -hmm. know, you're you're in a place. I mean, we do love every dealer to sell everything that the consumer needs. Right. But to get a, a brick and mortar dealer in this day and age to be efficient in handling you know, parts that they might only sell one of every six months. To that dealer, that's dollar bills tied up in inventory that, you know, unfortunately with the the economic conditions over the last few years, it's difficult for that dealer to do that. Right. So the consumer is forced to, uh, you know, head to the Internet to make their purchases. And, you know, the Canadian Internet sellers, as far as Badger goes, there's not really one I can think of off the top of my head who, you know, does much uh, to support the product line. And that forces the, the people in Canada to come to the U.S. Win-win, um, we trust because of the fact we know that they have uh, everything that we need. Coast Airbrush is another right. good resource uh, uh, online that we, uh, that we highly recommend. If uh, you need to get something, if they don't have it, they'll make certain it's on the next order. Um, that uh, that they have uh, coming from Badger, but uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the price for living uh, in Canada as it comes to yeah. to Badger Airbrush. And I, you know, I, I don't know that that problem is exclusive to us. Um, I wish I had a better answer and remedy for it, uh, but until we do, you know, they kind of have to keep uh, you know spending a little bit yeah. more money uh, um, to get it and. You know, I, I guess the one recommendation I would make to someone in that position is have some foresight. You know, if you if you do have to order a tip or needle, have some foresight into things you might also need somewhere down the line and get those at the same time so you can right. amortize that shipping cost uh, over several items and uh, be a little bit uh, uh, um, proficient in your purchase. Right, paint, it, so. lube, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and uh, what about Australia? Australia has been a real uh, conundrum for mm -hmm. us because, um, actually, Australia, I, sh I shouldn't clarify that. Australia is getting better, mm -hmm. um, especially for you war gamers, because yeah. we have two people in Australia who we know have either product in stock or on their way to it. Mod FX is one of them, okay. and Defiant Gaming, Defiant Gaming. Uh, is another one off the top of my head. That has been the one neat thing about Minotaur is that it has opened some new distribution channels for us only because as dealers like Mod FX and, uh, uh, and Defiant Gaming came to us, we didn't really have a place to send them um, to get products, so we handled it directly uh, with them. So you do have a couple resources there that if they don't have the product yet, they will have the product soon mm -hmm. um, in Australia. 
Uh, we do have other distributors in Australia, Southern Airbrush Supply and uh, Airbrush Focus in another, is another. They tend to be more in the fine art, custom auto um, category, but they do have products. They're not going to have anything Minotaur right. um, related, but uh, but those are some of the resources that you, that you have there. So. Okay. Great, and I think that's it. Is there anything else? You that's want to it. Talk about? Sure. So we can we can go to brunch now. Yeah, we're going to brunch. Cool. All right. So uh, thank you guys for joining us, and that's it for Ask Ken. And uh, maybe we'll do it again next year and uh, probably ask, ask answer the same questions that we. We could answer. do it next week at Adepticon. We could <laughs> if we really wanted to. That's it, guys. Thank you uh, for watching, and uh, remember sub if you haven't. And uh, favorite if you love me and all that jazz. And cool. Yeah. Talk to you guys later.